an archetype that men get confused with women and you know that's the witchy part of women and that's the part that's attractive 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 but rejecting 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 and so many men are petrified by women they won't approach them at all they have no idea how to talk to them they're just petrified into immobility and that's way more common than you think and so that breeds resentment like you wouldn't believe you know you hear the guy who shot up like um, um, Dawson College it's like what the hell do you think motivated him it's like he, he, that's what he saw, and, and it was because, well, he was, my opinion is he was too goddamn useless to be attractive to anyone, and so that's a hell of a place to be in, you know, and then that's the problem too, if you're chronically rejected by people, it's often because of your own insufficiencies, you know, whether that's cowardice or lack of social skills or whatever it is, it's like, you can't just brush it off as, oh, well, you know, no one likes me, but really I'm okay, it's like, no, no, wrong if everyone rejects you there's probably something wrong and it's probably deep and difficult and it's going to be horrible to fix and so it's this isn't a trivial problem it's not a trivial problem at all and so you know that's mother nature for men too because from from the sexual selection point of view if they if they're not selected as a mate nature has taken them out of the game right and so, you know, people don't really like that. They're not that happy with that. And so, but getting all whiny about it and then getting violent is like, that's just not all, not really very helpful, although it's very common. So, this is Lynn Isabel. An evolutionary arms race between early snakes and mammals triggered the development of improved vision and large brain in primates, a radical new theory suggests. These are old representations. I really like this one. This is, I don't remember, I think it's Greek but it doesn't exactly look Greek, it might be older. It doesn't matter anyways. You see, it's the same thing, the same idea as, as, as Graham's dream, right? It's like, there's this thing that exists, this, this multi-headed snake, and it's got this infinity problem, it's everywhere. That's that little circle down there. And the problem is, well, what do you do with it? You cut up one head, seven more grow. That's the eternal problem of life. And the problem is, there, there, there is the category of problems in life, and it ain't going anywhere. So the question is, can you deal with the whole category at the same time? That's the thing. That's how to be in the world, is to deal with that category all at the same time. And so how did, how did human beings, what did they come up with as a solution? And that's so cool too, because the solution they come up with, not only was the heroism that allows you to approach what you're terrified by and what you find offensive, and to learn from it, but also the idea of sacrifice, and, and that was played out by cultures everywhere, including human sacrifice. And you think, what the hell was up with those crazy bastards so long ago? They were sacrificing to gods all the time. What kind of clueless behavior was that? Burn something and please God. Burn something valuable and please God. It's like, what was with them? What were they thinking? Well, they weren't stupid, those people. If they were stupid, we wouldn't be here. They were not stupid. And believe me, they lived under a lot harsher conditions than we do. So those were some tough people, man. You know, back then you'd last about 15 minutes. And so you don't want to be thinking of your ancestors as stupid. Like there's no real evidence that we're much different cognitively than we were 150,000 years ago. So anyways, sacrifice, what does that mean, sacrifice? Well, it's a discovery, man. It's the discovery of the future. It's like the future is actually the place where there is threat. And it's always going to be there, so what do you do? You make sacrifices in the present so that the future is better. Right. Everyone does that. That's what you're doing right now. That's what you're doing here. That's what your parents are doing when they pay money to send you to university. They think, you can bargain with reality. It's amazing. You can bargain with reality. You can forestall gratification now. And it'll pay off at a, at a place and time that doesn't even exist yet. It's like, who would have believed that? It's like, that's a miracle that that occurs. And it's not like people just figured that out overnight. You know, we were chimps for Christ's sake. Like, how are we gonna come up with an idea like that? Well, it's like, well, we thought about it for seven million years. And, you know, we got to the point where we could kind of act it out. But we didn't know what we were doing. But it was a, it emerged, it's like a dream. It was, so the terror of the future is a dream. And the solution to the terror, the dream of the terror of the future, is another dream. And, and it, it comes out in mythology and in fantasy and in drama, where you act out the sacrifice. 
and then it's a step on the way to full understanding. So we can say sacrifice now instead of doing it, you know, although we still do it. It's just not concretized like it used to be. We do it abstractly and we all have faith that it will work. You know, and we also set up our society so that it'll work. And one thing about, you know, I'm not a fan of moral relativism for a variety of reasons, partly because I think it's an, it's an extreme form of cowardice. But anyways, apart from that, no, 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 no. There's minimal ways that you can set up a society that will work. And so one of them is, is that the society has to be set up so that your sacrifices will pay off or you won't work and then the society will die. And so it has to make promises. People have to make promises to one another. And that's what money is. Money is a promise that your sacrifice will pay off in the future. That's what money is. And so if the society is stable, you can store up your work right now. You can sacrifice your impulses and you can work and you can store up credit for the future. And then you can make the future a better place. But society has to be stable enough to allow for that. Hyperinflation will do you in. So the promise that's implicit in the currency is the promise that what you're doing now will pay off in the future. And if people don't have that promise, then, well, we know what they do. Because in, in gangs, for example, in, say, gangs in North America, the time horizon of the gang members shrinks rapidly because they don't really expect to be alive much past 21. And so they get really impulsive and violent. And like, why the hell not? That's, that's what you do when, when the future doesn't matter, when it's not real. You, you default back to living in the moment and you take what you can get right now. And no wonder, because you don't know if you're gonna be around in a, in a year. And you get whatever you can, well, you can bloody well get it. And that's like anarchy, that state. And so you don't wanna live in, some people like to live in that state because they're really wired for that, you know? And so they're, they're much more comfortable in those conditions. They're, they're kind of like warrior types, I would say in some sense. But, you know, for most people, that's just, well, that stress will just do you in, you know, the stress of a life like that, so. Um, that, see, the Egyptians, they worship the eye. Yeah, well, that's cool because, well, why did they worship the eye? Well, wake the hell up and look at the world. That's your salvation to do that. Pay bloody attention, especially to the things you don't want to pay attention to. And use your vision, have some vision. And you can use your vision to see into the future. And that is your, that's your redemption. And the Egyptians, they didn't know how to say that, but they knew how to represent it. And that's how they represented it. Like the pupil on that is completely open, completely dilated. And that's a God as far as the Egyptians were concerned. It's Horus, and I'll tell you Horus' story at some point.